Good afternoon. I'm Patricia Jimenez, teacher librarian and a member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. That information is also in the chat. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. Please support AZLA. When you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. The AZLA professional development webinars reach librarians and library professionals in Arizona and throughout the USA. Do you know a business or organization that would benefit from direct access to library professionals? Contact us at development at azla.org for sponsorship levels and rates. I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On July 14th, join us for a tri-university approach to strengthen Arizona research data management services with Fernando Rios, Brittany Blanchard, and Matthew Harp. Since 2017, information professionals at Arizona State have collaborated with those at the University of Arizona, the only state university in Arizona with a medical school, and Northern Arizona University on multiple cross-disciplinary scholarly communications projects. Arising in lockstep with these efforts are data compliance, sharing, and preservation questions that we must address at the institutional level. The impacts of COVID-19 on academia affected all aspects of the research, ranging from the undergraduate experience to the research enterprise. Research activities centered on the virus have been a priority of funders such as the NSF and NIH, with an added global interest in sharing that research as quickly as possible. In this presentation, attendees will gain an inside view of how the libraries at the three universities collaboratively tackled research data management issues highlighted by the pandemic, including an increased need to provide data sharing services and the lack of a tri-university research data policy. Registration for this webinar is posted to the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Catherine Lockmiller and Megan McGuire for their presentation, AZLA Diversity Committee Leading for the Future of Libraries.
Thank you, Patty. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be here with everybody today. We're going to try to breeze through this and provide as much information to you as we can about the diversity, equity, equity, diversity, and inclusion committee. Uh, the work that we're the work that we're doing and uh, the work that we hope to do, and also we really want to hear from everybody that's present what you want to see from this committee and how you uh, envision yourself being a part of it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, and hopefully this will work just fine as seamlessly as possible. and we can go ahead and get the ball rolling. So again, thank you for attending. This is um, an AZLA webinar focusing on the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee uh, that was recently formed in AZLA, the work that we're doing and the work that we hope to do. My name is Katherine Lockmiller. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a health science librarian at Northern Arizona University stationed at the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. I, I even see here that I like animals. So, and you'll probably see in my screen, my animals just sort of lazily trying to avoid the heat and find AC. And it's 109 degrees today in Phoenix. So, you know, they're the wise ones. Um, but I've been a librarian since 2018. I've been working in libraries since uh, 2014. I've been working in higher education since uh, 2011. And equity, diversity, and inclusion issues are important to me, uh, not only because they uh, have created opportunities for me as a, as a trans woman and a queer woman to be able to participate more fully in um, librarianship, academia, and our society at large, but also because they provide uh, inroads for other people who've experienced marginalization and historical underrepresentation uh, means of being able to more easily function and um, flow in our, within the societal constraints that have been constructed to prevent that from happening. I'll go ahead and let my co-presenter uh, co introduce herself now. Hi everyone, my name is Megan McGuire. I'm a librarian at Mesa Community College. And sadly, I have no fuzzy cute animals like cat. I only have a fish and several hermit crabs that are totally fascinating. But weird. Um, I've worked in libraries for 25 years at Mace Community College specifically for like 23 years and I've been staff and adjunct and full-time faculty so I've done a lot of roles and I've been actively involved in DI efforts at our college for a long time so those are my kiddos. They like to go out and participate. I didn't want to find a picture of their face because you know but we like to be out and volunteer in our community and be active. So. Thanks. And I think it's pretty cool that you have ocean creatures in your home. Um, I just read today, so it's a tidbit of, I don't know, knowledge for people here that shellfish have many eyes, but don't actually see with them. Rather, they are able to sense vibrations with their eyes. And I was trying to imagine what that would be like and just sort of spiraled into an existential crisis today, just thinking about shellfish eyes. So yeah, ocean creatures are cool. Okay, so we don't have a ton of time today, but we're going to cover a lot of ground in the time that we do have. Uh, first, what we want to do is we're going to try and provide you with the sort of baseline information about, about this committee, how it was formed and under, under the sort of criteria that it was formed, um, with the original goals that the committee had. Um, this is not a very old committee. Uh, and, and so it's, it's still in nascent stages, um, but there's already been a lot of work done to get it moving and get it off the ground. Uh, secondly, we're going to, try, we're going to um, presume that, that the audience, while you might have a really thorough understanding of the terms equity, diversity, and inclusion, we're going to presume that maybe some people here do not. Maybe some people here are not familiar with these terms. You've encountered them in various maybe occupational contexts, but they're still kind of new to you. 
Uh, we're going to cover that. We're going to cover what we mean when we use these terms, and we're going to ask you a little bit too. Uh, what do you think about when you hear those words? Uh, after we've done that, after we've laid that groundwork, uh, we're going to spend about 20 minutes today talking about the first major project um, that this committee undertook in collaboration with uh, University of Arizona's um, Knowledge River, uh, Knowledge R River um, with uh, Berlin Loa. Uh, this was a um, survey of BIPOC library workers and library students in the state of Arizona and then the sort of report that we generated from that. So that was a lot of work developing that survey. It was a lot of work being able to compile it and then present that information. We're excited to share with you what we've learned and sort of what we hope to, to do with that. Um, the last portion of the, of the talk today will focus more so on the future. What do we want this committee to, to do? Uh, who do we want it to be? Uh, and how do we imagine our fellow library workers and library students throughout the state and library volunteers having a role to play in the future of the EDI committee? Um, lastly, we'll take questions. And additionally, if you have questions during the talk, you can land them in the chat. We may not get to them until the end, and um, we'll try to get through everything. Uh, one thing I can tell you is if we don't answer every question you have, then um, you are uh, we will get back to you in, in another format. So we can always email you. We can always exchange information and try to help you as much as possible if you have any questions or concerns afterwards. So the second bit of uh, groundwork we want to lay before we keep going here is uh, this committee, when we were thinking about this presentation and sort of announcing the presence of this committee to the wider organization, um, a lot has been happening throughout the United States and in the state of Arizona, and we felt that we had an obligation to speak up about it. So just um, maybe be mindful and attentive while I read this solidarity statement that was constructed by the committee um, organizers. Before we begin today's webinar, we wish to speak as members of the AZLA EDI committee. The AZLA EDI committee stands in solidarity with all racialized, queer, disabled, and oppressed people in library communities across Arizona and in the United States. We oppose the ongoing violence against Black, Jewish, Asian, and other marginalized communities as well as nationwide legal attacks against women, queer, and trans people. These hateful events are in direct contradiction to the ideals of a democratic and just society. Libraries in particular have the capacity to provide equitable and inclusive spaces, programs, and knowledge which supports marginalized people. And so in this month of pride and then in the days prior to Juneteenth, we call on our libraries to take action to bring thoughtful social justice oriented interventions into practice for the benefit of library members, as well as workers, students, and volunteers. All right, I'm going to turn over to Megan now, who's going to walk you through the history and the terminology that we use. Thanks, Kat. So brief history, in fall 2020, the AZLA president put out a call to create an ad hoc EDI committee with the goals of defining what EDI means for AZLA to explore some initial initiatives for us to complete and to develop an EDI strategic action plan for AZLA. So we worked on that and in the spring, uh, we submitted a paper proposal, something to AZLA and the AZLA formalized the EDI committee and adopted the EDI statement and definitions, which I'll go over with you after this. And we've also created initiative suggestions for an AZLA strategic plan and worked with Knowledge River from U of A to create and administer the BIPOC library worker survey, which Kat will go over with you. So before I tell you the definitions that we adopted formally, we thought it would be fun, interesting to talk with you on how you as individuals define diversity. So please feel free to put in the chat Take a moment if you need. How would you define diversity? Yeah, or what words does diversity put you in mind of, as Kat said? Right. 
we're totally gonna play the Jeopardy music. But, um, <laughs> people, people have to answer. It's so integral to our to our sense of self validation. <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks Christine. Christine. Variety of ways humans present and interact. Yes. Variety, multitude, difference. Variety of points of view and experience. What makes us unique individuals? Yes, diversity makes this world work. Variety of backgrounds, life experience, ideas, factors that people bring, varying perspectives. None confining, that's a good word. All right, so. <clears throat> The ways in which human beings express themselves to the world. Great, thanks, Monica. So yeah, so diversity as we came to define it is diversity can be defined as some of the ways that people are both alike and different. Visible diversity is generally those attributes or characteristics that are external. However, diversity goes beyond external to internal characteristics that we choose to define as invisible diversity. Invisible diversity includes those characteristics and attributes that are not readily seen. When we recognize value and embrace diversity, we are recognizing, valuing, and embracing the uniqueness of each individual. So diversity can be expressed, like all of you pretty much said, in a variety of ways and forms. In all the different aspects of an individual is what makes them diverse, right? How about inclusion? How would you define inclusion? Representation, <laughs> can't say the opposite of exclusion. Appreciating what makes us unique, acknowledgement, acceptance. Yes, means to include all. Respectful welcome. Oh, you're going fast now. All have a voice, being part of something, feeling you belong. Belonging is really important. Validation, yes. Feeling welcome and seen and included. Did I miss anything? Yeah, those are all great definitions. And ours is, can you go to the next cat? <clears throat> and you all touched on our definition too. Inclusion means an environment in which all individuals are treated fairly and respectfully, are valued for their distinctive skills, experiences, and perspectives, have equal access to resources and opportunities, and can contribute fully to the organization's success. Yes, specifically seeking voices not immediately represented. That's really great. So <clears throat> inclusion is like leveraging and interacting with the diversity around us, right? And integrating our different backgrounds, ideas, perspectives into how we operate and create value for our institutions. And it's something that is ongoing, right? It's active, it's how we do things. It's not like a one and done thing. It's how we operate, right? And one more thing about inclusion. <clears throat> I like to think of inclusion on an individual level. And you all put these things in their validation voices that are not immediately represented. Inclusion on an individual level is feeling like you're an insider and that you belong. And somebody mentioned belonging, right? It's experiencing belonging though without having to sacrifice what makes you unique. And some people feel they only belong after hiding or minimizing parts of themselves, but that, you know, is not true inclusion. True inclusion is feeling you belong while what makes you unique is recognized and valued. So what about equity? Equity is a little harder. <laughs> Thanks. 
fairness, yes. Equal, equal access. <clears throat> Understanding many people don't have the same footing to begin with, great, yes. Allocating resources so we can all reach equality. Going further than equality by taking individual circumstances into consideration to better ensure each and all can benefit. Perfect. So you all already know all this stuff. So our definition we came to is, next screen cap. Equity is not the same as formal equality, like you implied. <clears throat> formal equality implies sameness. Equity, on the other hand, assumes difference and takes difference into account, as all of you mentioned, to ensure a fair process and ultimately a fair or equitable outcome. Equity recognizes that some groups were and are disadvantaged in accessing educational and employment opportunities and are therefore underrepresented or marginalized in many organizations and institutions. The effects of that exclusion offer linger systemically within organizational policies, practices, and procedures. Equity therefore means increasing diversity by ameliorating conditions of disadvantaged groups. So Jessica put reaching a point where folks outcome cannot be predicted. Right. So we're, it strives to ensure equally high outcomes for everyone, right? And removes barriers that have been created by different societal and cultural factors. And everyone has what they need to succeed. So. Can I add something really quick to that? Yes, please. Um, one thing that I want to kind of touch on that a few people mentioned in the chat and I think is really important is, is sort of qualifying the distinctions between our use of equality as a social justice term and our, and our, our use of equity as a, as a justice oriented term. Um, and that both have their own value, but when we say equality, historically, there's been a lot of baggage around that term because it's associated with sameness. It's associated with the notion that um, if one creates a sort of neutral environment, um, then everybody will equally have the opportunity to reach the goals that are sort of set in place within that environment. But we recognize now with data, like science, with social sciences, with history, with all of these different disciplines, we, have, we find that that equal playing field just doesn't exist. And particularly within a social context where histories of racism and ableism and homophobia and sexism have created their own systematic barriers preventing people from reaching those goalposts. So um, just in case there were people maybe here who, who weren't all clear on the distinction between equality and equity, you know, maybe that helps. And, and a very common um, sort of image that gets used is the image of say, people at a, at a baseball, like standing outside of, of, a, of a baseball field and trying to look over the, at the, the fence at the game. And so if you build the fence, it's the fence is a horizontal straight line. Um, but we all know that not everybody is the same size. We know that not everybody is going to be able to look over that fence line in a way that gives them the best possible view of the game. So we use other tools in order to give other people the ability to to see the game so whether we like in the image you might see someone with like a box that they're standing on um or somebody who has like somebody who's maybe they're resting on someone's shoulders um so maybe that image also helps to provide provide that sort of um distinction for you i like the one that adds justice and the fence is just gone so, yeah, me too. I'm a utopian in that way. <laughs> okay. So next slide. Thank you, Kat. So we incorporated those three values and principles into a mission statement that would help guide our work and give us a shared vision on the work we're going to do. And that mission statement is 
Equity, diversity, and inclusion are fundamental values of the Arizona Library Association and its members. We support Arizona libraries and library workers in creating justice-centered workspaces that represent the communities we exist to serve. To accomplish this, we facilitate conversations around non-discrimination and equitable opportunity as they impact the profession of those we serve as allies. We use a social justice framework to inform library policies, development of resources, collections, displays, and programs. We strive to create an association culture where these values are incorporated into library workers' everyday activities. So this is what we use to come up with our list of initiatives. And the first one that we've done is the BIPOC Library Worker Survey. So Kat is going to go over that real quick. Sweet. Um, okay, so this was a large scale um, <clears throat> project that took a lot of working hands, a lot of moving parts. Um, so we, we really want to be clear that the people who, who did this, this work get the, um, the proper attention that they deserve. So. Um, these are the curators who had a hand in whether it was <laughs> getting this, this survey off the ground um, or helping to organize the committee, helping to um, create the survey or edit, revise, um, to distribute it, um, and then finally to organize that data and then <clears throat> analyze it and compile it again in the form of a report um, that all of these members, my, myself, um, the other co-chair of our EDI committee, Jess Sallow, um, Judy Morelon, Me Megan as well, um, Christina Santiago, um, Stacey Akahochi, Berlin Loa, and Lindsay Power. So we're really grateful um, to everybody that took part in this and um, we couldn't have done it without all of these team members working together. Okay, so what was this what was this survey? It was an it was a survey intended to document the job search and hiring practices um, and experiences of BIPOC identifying LIS graduate students and library workers seeking employment in the state of Arizona. Um, this includes those currently working in the field as well as those seeking employment. Um, so we we wanted to find out what it was like both to go through the hiring process and then if a job was um, procured, what it was like being in that position as a BIPOC library worker. And if somebody um, had negative experiences, what were those? If someone had positive experiences, what were those? And we did find some common themes throughout, uh, which I'm gonna go over, um, but um, uh, there was also variety in answers. Um, not all positions are the same, not all experiences were the same. Um, so that was another important factor that we learned here. Okay, so ah, I'm on the wrong tab. There we go. Okay, so who took the survey? Um, we did. We did <clears throat> limit the survey participation to individuals who belong to historically racialized um, communities. Um, we were not looking for the experiences of um, white people in compiling these results. Um, and, and additionally, I should mention, if you are not familiar with the term BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, um, it, it's that, that term stands for Black, Indigenous, and or persons of color, depending on who you ask. And uh, we, we use this term, we felt that this term was the most cohesive, the most responsive to kind of, I think, getting to the experiences of individuals who are most likely in Arizona to experience that form of underrepresentation in library work. Um, so as for, as for the demographic uh, makeup of our survey participants, 31% um, were um, biracial or multiracial. Um, the largest group were Hispanic um, or Latin, um, followed by a, uh, equal, um, an equal distribution of Black and Indigenous participants, and then 7% of participants identified as Asian or Asian American. <laughs> Similarly, and, and perhaps unsurprisingly, because of the, you know, the challenges with distributing a survey like this, 
outside of a professional organization like AZLA, most people had a master's degree. Um, MA is the term used there, but it doesn't have to be a master of arts, obviously an MLS or an, an ME, um, but generally an MLS are the, are the highest degree obtained. Um, I was just checking the chat there. Okay, cool. So 67%, uh, most participants had a master's degree. Most participants were either in a position where they had just graduated from library school, they were already a professional librarian, credentialed librarian, or they were a library um, staff worker who um, had a master's degree. Maybe they were seeking employment um, as a professional librarian or maybe, or, or perhaps not. Those two things are not necessarily in line with one another. Um, <clears throat> additionally, 23% had a bachelor's degree. This does not mean a bachelor's degree in library science could be any bachelor's degree. Um, <clears throat> so roughly one third did not have a master's degree. Um, in terms of the type of employment that our uh, participants um, procured, mo uh, unsurprisingly to I, from my perspective um, with ACLA was that the majority of uh, the largest number of respondents, I shouldn't say the majority, the largest number of respondents, 36%, were in a professional position within a public library. Um, followed, followed next by quite a bit, quite a large margin of 15%, followed by uh, academic librarians. And um, you can see here, we did have a few individuals who uh, completed the survey who worked in special libraries or museums. Uh, it was actually really interesting to get those experiences too. If you're a person here today who works in um, maybe the kind of library that's not often represented in discussions about librarianship, um, what we found that here was that uh, some of the more, uh, I think, interesting and, and, and oftentimes very verbose explanations, perhaps a feeling of not being heard, um, were, were provided to us by individuals in these capacities. All right, so like I said, we focused on the sort of linear nature of the hire of the employee uh, employee lifespan, beginning with the hiring process, beginning with per, beginning with filling out a, a um, application, submitting a resume, getting an interview. Um, <clears throat> so one one I think factor that was important that feels feels like a positive. Eighty seven percent of our um, survey respondents. Felt, uh, they felt a sense of comfort during the interview process. And this could be because of a number of things. Maybe they, they had um, other people on the committee who they saw a bit of themselves in. Maybe they, um, um, some people mentioned uh, things like diversity statements at the, at, like on a resume or an application. Um, if you are in a capacity too in a library right now where you're thinking, where you're you know, maybe about the sort of hiring um, process. Um, some of the things that we've learned here, if you wanted to reach out to us, um, the things that made people feel comfortable, there was a lot of common ground um, in those experiences. Uh, so uh, importantly too, 44% um, of the um, people who had gone through a hiring process had um, identified in some way, whether by physical appearance or some other method, they, they noticed that there was another, uh, that there was a BIPOC person in their interview committee. Um, this, you know, this could make, this could be interesting for, for libraries, but I know that also coming from an academic library position, one of the challenges in this capacity too is that not all people on interview committees work in libraries, right? Um, so even though this looks like a like an, a number that's getting higher compared to the number of BIPOC librarians that we actually have, um, this number could also be a bit illusory. One, because not all people on hiring committees work in libraries and also due to the nature that a lot of libraries are required to meet sort of equality goals in order to, to form a committee um, through their institution. So um, there are a lot of factors that are behind these numbers. So some of the qualitative feedback that we received in addition to quantitative numbers regarding the hiring process, um, 
people mentioned, these were, were words that were commonly used that we were able to suss out. Um, people felt, and these are the more negative, I think, terms. So we, we already see like some quantitative um, evidence that there were people who felt comfortable. But why did people feel uncomfortable or why did people or what are the uncomfortable elements that people were able to point out? And um, people found that questions were uh, sometimes invasive. Um, people felt that their experience of the interview was rushed, um, that it didn't feel personal. Um, I, I connect impersonal and rigid um, and honestly, I connect these five words in my mind to this sort of bureaucratic, they were, they were bureaucratic, that they felt like they weren't um, necessarily wanted, that they felt like this was just wrote or by the numbers, that, the, that this did not feel like a welcoming or inviting space. Um, something that is really problematic when we're talking about libraries, which many of us prize our spaces for being welcoming and inclusive. Um, if we can't meet those standards that we have for ourselves within a interview committee, how can we expect that to happen beyond the interview process? Um, so this was an important factor um, in understanding why people felt that interviews themselves were maybe not personal enough. So in that sort of hazy space between hiring and retention, 11% of the respondents noted that there was not an EEO statement in job postings. Now this also means um, this, this, you know, can be, this, this is a challenging question. Sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here, trying best to explain this. Um, you will see that 41% saw some sort of DEI or EDI or diversity statement in, a, in their job postings when they, before they um, applied for the position. Um, the majority of respondents don't remember or didn't notice. Part of this is beholden to the uh, how how long it has been since that person applied for that job. Um, if we look at it in terms of like linear time, uh, have the EI statements um, increased on on um, job application or job postings? That could be one factor behind why um, people could didn't notice. People might not have noticed too, because sometimes these statements get buried at the bottom of a job posting, or they get buried under a link, or if somebody finds the job in like Indeed, then, um, or another job hosting site, then they may never have seen it because not all of that information is portrayed. So there are a number of reasons why a person might not have seen one. On the other hand, it's also very likely that one never existed. So um, we have to take into account that at least 11% of respondents, um, which is a number that comes close to that, that number that said that they felt uncomfortable during the hiring process, um, didn't even see a diversity statement or posting. Uh, we, ideally, we would get that number to zero that didn't see one. Okay, so after hiring, so um, after a person um, received an offer and took a position, um, we, we wanted to find out what that experience like. What was their experience being onboarded as a, a BIPOC library worker? What was their experience after onboarding? <clears throat> and the language that we use at the top here, retain workforce diversity by instituting welcoming environment practices and by providing support systems and opportunities for professional growth and career enhancement comes from the state of Arizona's sort of um, key practices for, for organizations um, to follow in terms of EEOC and worker and workplace compliance. <clears throat> Huge number. Um, I felt this was this was big. I, um, I suppose it could be larger, but half of our respondents had had or were uncertain about the potential or the opportunity for advancement within their position. Um, that that the way that this was framed in qualitative feedback that we received was that people felt in some cases that what they'd been told had changed. So maybe they had a um, library director or a supervisor, a person in charge who had who had told them before they ever took a job, yeah, there's lots of opportunities here to 
to grow, to, to move forward in your career, and that that person had since left, or what that person had said was informal and therefore didn't count. Um, in the other, other cases, um, opportunities for advancement were slowly wiped away by drops in funding or COVID or other mitigating circumstances, um, but that people still felt uncertain. Um, and and what, what I, for me, when I look at that, I see uncertainty as a sign of anxiety. So at least if you know that you're probably not going to get advancement, you can start beginning to think about your options. Do I want to take this job or do I want to move elsewhere? But if you're left floundering and, and, and sort of in this haze, then uh, what do you do? Uh, what decisions do you make for yourself? Um, additionally, um, that 50%, so what's countering that 50% is 37% though did indicate supervisor support for advancement. Um, this does not mean that they were going to receive advancement or that it was a sentence, that it was set in stone, rather that they had supervisors that indicated that they would find ways to help a person advance, whether that was through professional development, through writing them letters, through um, moving them forward. So for academic librarians, helping them find means to um, be promoted, um, other sort of factors where a supervisor could provide help or assistance in some manner. So this was one example of qualitative feedback. Uh, you can we can ignore the page number. Um, if, if you if you want to see this report, just contact me directly. I can provide you with information. Um, but um, from pages 12 and 13 of the full report, one of the um, persons who had, had completed the form stated, as a Black person, I feel I cannot share my ambition during an interview for fear of not being hired. Too many times folks do not want Blacks to advance and find the threat if we try to advance. And uh, for those of us who were working on the survey, this resonated. This was a uh, commonly, this was, this was not an isolated statement. This statement should be looked at in the context of other people having said something similar or something with the same sentiment, um, where they felt that they could not talk about their goals or their wants, their desires as a librarian or as a person who wanted to become a librarian um, for fear of retribution or for fear that someone would think less of them due to the color of their skin or the racialization that they've experienced. Um, and uh, that having felt that way um, is very likely because they have been treated that way in another capacity, whether in school or in another, another job. So um, one important, we, uh, if, if you look at the, the research behind mentorship, uh, mentorship is one of the most important um, factors when it comes to giving workers a sense of belonging or a sense of that inclusion, a sense that they are um, welcome in a space. And it's one of the factors that helps keep, uh, for employers, that helps keep workers around, um, that keeps them in a position for an extended period of time. Um, so <laughs> even if that's, even though that's the case, 84% of the people who completed this survey had not ever had a formal mentor at a library in Arizona. Um, so uh, pretty resound, pretty high number had, had never had a formal mentor. Uh, we define formal mentor as somebody who was sort of assigned to them, whether an individual mentor or a group mentor, um, intentionally by their employer. Um, that was never provided in any way. Some people might seek out informal mentorship, but that does not sort of count for the purposes of this survey. So um, in, a, in addition to, to the lack of mentorship options, these are some other um, data points that we found that relate to retention and performance. So 39 respondents described the mentoring experiences that they did have. Um, so this would be that 16% who had a, had a mentor, I suppose. Um, 14 of that 39 described an informal experience. So they went out of their own way. They, they used their own time um, in order to find somebody to help them find their, their footing. Um, 14 other respondents indicated that having a formal mentor would have increased their success. 
So they, they strongly believe that having a mentor in place would have made um, life easier for them in the workplace. Nine respondents indicated the benefits of having a mentor and um, two respondents had a negative experience. So a uh, small number did not have a good experience. Uh, one thing that I should point out here, it's not mentioned in this, in, in this information, but um, ideally, if we're talking about mentorship programs for um, BIPOC workers, we're, we're looking at programs that help to connect people who with other individuals working in libraries who've also experienced similar um, maybe disadvantage or oppression uh, minoritization so this would be being able ideally we could look at azla as being a place that connects bipoc library workers with other bipoc library workers as a means to help people sort of become more um, more ingrained and have a sense of belonging within the greater library community in Arizona. I'm just going to check the chat really quickly. Um, yeah, um, and I can I can uh, dis discuss some of this um, in the Q&A. So we only have five minutes left, but I'm nearly I'm nearly done here. Um, oh, we still have to cover our future stuff. <laughs> so these are um, this is overall qualitative feedback that we received. This does not fall within the, the sort of um, trifold, uh, um, the sort of those sort of um, themes that I just mentioned um, involving hiring, retention, and performance. Um, but we felt that these were strong, also strongly representative of the um, uh, emotional heft of the survey. I took over a position for someone that recently retired, but I did not receive a promotion or raise, only increased responsibility. The person who I replaced, a white male, was being paid $30,000 more than my salary in a tenure track position. My current status is non-tenure track. Um, so one individual who um, po pointed out a very common thread here, which was um, positions being filled with less benefits. Um, the same amount of work or more work, but less offerings in that same capacity. Um, and oftentimes with poor individuals who are already more likely to experience financial burden um, by virtue of being BIPOC um, in Arizona. So cost of living is rising in Arizona and this organization's salaries absolutely do not reflect this. The organization they're talking about their workplace, not ACLA. Um, very displeased with the compensation and the amount of work we have to do. I will discuss this um, because I think the biggest thread we saw in this survey is, is indicative in all three of these answers here. Um, and I was not given the impression that advancement was an option in this position. I was told that as long as I didn't mess up, I'd have this position until retirement. Wow, like I feel like this statement is really unsettling that a person has to rely on the goodwill and um, informal like gentleman's handshake from a supervisor in order to feel like they're going to have a job if there are cutbacks or if somebody if something happens. Um, so there is a strong sense of anxiety, of uncertainty about the uh, long-term capacity of positions people have um, in libraries in the state. But perhaps um, most common, uh, a very common experience that we heard was um, a lot of respondents indicated that they had low wages and that they were being asked to do more for those wages. Um, so one of the most uh, perhaps important uh, factors that we can focus on in some ways is, is actually related to material, material gain um, of some sort. Um, so conclusions that we had based on that feedback. These are the sort of goals that we put in mind that we put forth to the AZLA board. This is what we hope to see from AZLA. Um, and this is what we want to do ourselves. So um, we provided an initial survey report already um, to the AZLA committee. Um, and now we are in the process. Of, and if anybody here is interested in assisting us with this, please let us know. We just we could, we certainly need assistance um, you know, completing all of these steps. But we're currently on step two where we are as a committee developing a follow-up um, <clears throat> series of group interviews and focus groups, um, an EBI committee roundtable discussion at the AZLA conference, step three, um, with the recommendation that at least 30% of the board attend, 
um, professional development, mentorship, training, and other opportunities to seek secure workplace advancement and possible increase in compensation and struck by strive to decenter whiteness within institutions by including more BIPOC representation via recruitment and retention efforts and leadership roles. Um, so this is a scaffolded approach. Okay, so the last thing I have is the last slide. Um, we have um, we have we have plans aside from what I just mentioned. We we have goals that we want to achieve, and um, we we need help achieving them <laughs> because there aren't many of us, and we're all overworked and underpaid, especially the especially BIPOC library workers. So um, what we want to see happen. We want to create a resource repository to assist in collection development. Um, this would be something that, especially if you have collection development experience, if you're interested in maybe developing uh, or building collection development experience, I don't know how to say that, um, this would potentially be something that would be uh, worth considering. One other uh, thing that we hope to do is continue researching the lived experiences of marginalized library workers and students, and this goes beyond the BIPOC survey, um, we have interest in other surveys that follow a similar format, asking people who have experienced this work under representation and oppression, what it's like working in libraries here for them as well. Um, hosting a series focusing on training library administrators on the basic aspects of EBI. Um, so we know that a lot of the issues that were pointed out in the BIPOC survey, um, that those don't um, get resolved until we start working on helping people in leadership positions um, take charge of um, the history of racism and the history of creating barriers for BIPOC people within their libraries. Um, so that's one example of where we hope to see leadership um, professional development. Provide opportunities for members to connect and learn in informal settings. We're hoping to put together a series of, um, of meetups in different locations across the state. Um, right now, I, it's, like I said, it's, uh, I think I said earlier, it's 109 degrees here in Tempe. So, for, so I prefer I prefer Flagstaff. So anybody here in Flagstaff, just just await await my my coming. Um, and then lastly, provide more EDI focused webinars. So we're we're this is our first one actually in partnership with the Professional Development Committee. Um, the first of many. Um, webinars focusing on different EDI characteristics and tactics to build EDI in libraries. So that's all I have other than questions. Megan, do you have anything you'd like to add before we take questions? Well, just to please fill out that form that's in the chat to give us ideas on what you think that we should include in our future plans, or if you'd like to participate in any of the ones on the screen, or if you'd like to join us in any of this work please fill that out. Yeah, please do. It, I think John already um, mentioned um, EDI, e, um, EDI campus committees. That's um, something that we would love to see um, within like that form. It, everything that we can get in, in, in sort of that, that form will help us to sort of build goals. Um, we originally had plans to do a, um, meet up in Phoenix on the 17th. Um, and we can share more information if that is going to happen. <laughs> Stacy. <laughs> um, so uphill, um, hopefully, yeah, um, hopefully we're, we're doing good work and we're finding ways to <clears throat> make AZLA a more inviting um, organization and equization. And, Equity is it. I feel like I just combined the words equity and organization. So um, that's that's where my brain's at right now. Um, Anna asked about informal mentoring. I can check the report and see if we mentioned informal mentoring. Um, I know that people mentioned informal mentoring. So um, what? Yeah. So I in the in the um, that slide that I shared, 14 people brought up informal mentoring without us asking about it. So um, those were individuals, again, who had to seek out mentoring on their own terms. 
Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I was just going to add to Anna's statement. From my understanding, so, so myself and, and, a, and a few librarians a few years ago at, in a, at Northern Arizona University, we looked at sort of um, sort of research and data around mentoring in, in academic spaces. And one thing we found was that, yeah, any mentoring is generally good and generally better than none. Um, however, um, what, what informal mentoring often ends up doing is it ends up adding extra work and labor, um, unpaid labor for the individuals that are involved in it. And it also creates sort of opportunities too for things like predatory behavior and, and um, maybe things that we'd want to uh, discourage, obviously. So creating um, a sort of formal documentation and process, if you have that capacity, is provides that means to ensure that people have a safe and inclusive means of having mentorship. And there are a lot of ways to have mentors. There's not just one type of mentoring within that formal context. So um, it's a good question. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Patty. Oh, no. Um, I just, I had a couple questions here that I uh, wanted to share with you in our last few minutes. Um, I think the, the from what I'm, I'm getting is a, people are eager to step in, but, you know, you talked about um, the hiring process. And I mean, I've been a librarian for 16 years. I've never been on a hiring committee. Of, like we don't always, as the people who are doing the day-to-day -day job, um, have that privilege of being part of that process. So what can individual librarians and library, and library workers do to impact that that hiring process and make it um, better or more supportive for BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus uh, applicants? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think it's a really good question. And I, I, I can't, I've never been um, the sole librarian on a library hiring committee. I've been the sole librarian on other kinds of hiring committees. But um, one thing I, I can suggest, I think, is so I mentioned that diversity statement the the I think if, if within an organization um, and I don't think it needs to just be a library um, it, it, if you're in a in a school system or district or a public library system um, some sort of or finding people that you can work with to create some sort of organizational drive to do something as simple as put together a statement on diversity that can go into a job posting. Um, and I think that's a good first step. I think you can go beyond that. Um, and a lot of job postings, I think at this point are starting to include things like um, having applicants write a diversity statement. Like what is your personal experience with EDI and how does that inform your work as a you know, librarian or whatever. Um, so that's a, maybe a second step, but I think there are different, um, it can be scaffolded in that way. And I think as an individual too, um, perhaps you have the opportunity to, um, I think AZLA, like to work within AZLA, like you're doing right now, I think you're, you're a great example of someone who's working within a um, larger organizational body that can hopefully, I think, use things like leverage and other um, important tactics to um, kind of help libraries see what they should be doing. Um, I don't know, does that answer that at all? Yeah, I think so. Um, well, I want to thank you so much, both you and Megan, um, for uh, presenting and, and working with the Professional Development Committee today. Um, I'm looking forward to what else uh, your committee has uh, in the future for professional development. Uh, and I wanna thank all of our attendees for being with us today. Uh, you will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. Uh, make sure that you fill out that um, form for our panelists with other uh, ideas that you have that uh, the EDI committee can sort of start to address. Uh, as speaking as a former committee chair, it's always helpful to have other ideas and to get information from um, other people. 
So please fill that out and help them out. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.